So a notebook is a, is a sequence of cells. The, the first type of a cell is markdown. So if I double click on this area, you can see um, text in the format called markdown, which is a shorthand for HTML. And I can input um, links and images and um, using a JavaScript library called MathJax, I can uh, put in a lot of math, uh, math equations. And then if I um, like shift enter to render that cell, then that gets turned into nice HTML. So this is where you can put your prose and your explanation for, for what you're doing. And what this looks like um, on disk is that this notebook is a file with a .ipynb extension. Um, and it's uh, in a format, a text format called JSON. So it's in this uh, parsable uh, structured document. Um, so you can see that there's, it's like a dictionary that has cells and cells as a list and each cell has a cell type. So the first cell is a markdown cell. You can see the source um, to, to the input. Um, and then the next cell is a code cell and then it has output. So the, the single document has the code, so the code you want to execute. Um, so this is a, a command that I actually executed, and this is the output of that command. And so the document contains the input and the output, and then um, markdown uh, for prose explanations of what you're doing. So the idea of the notebook is it kind of encapsulates what you did, what the results are, um, and then your explanation for it, and then and you can share that around uh, in different ways. One of the ways you can share it um, is with the service uh, that we run called NB Viewer. So if you look, um, this is what, if you downloaded this file and just opened it with the text editor, it would look like this, which is not the most informative uh, file to look to look at. But if you open NB Viewer, you can see the same file. Um, this NB Viewer is a service that says, take any notebook on the internet, and it downloads it and then renders it as um, as a nice HTML page, so you can just say, make put your notebooks anywhere, and then people can um, can view them and see, and then download the original notebook and run them. So it's it is to facilitate kind of sharing of uh, the work that you did. Maybe you're um, doing some analysis and working with colleagues or an advisor or something, and you want to make it as as easy as possible for people to follow along and see what you've been doing. And so we can actually see this notebook without the, the first image, but on, on the viewer. But mostly what we're going to talk about today is IPython. So facilitating the actual work that um, you're doing in a class like this is you're learning to uh, write code, and you're exploring, and you're figuring out uh, what you want to do. And in interactive computing and research in general, uh, part of the point is that we don't actually know what we want to do. That the whole point is it's a it's a learning experience where you know you have some goal um, of understanding some data or uh, or something like that, but you don't necessarily know exactly how you're going to get there. Um, and IPython is all about facilitating that process. So at the very basic level, um, with these code cells, I can type some Python code and then I can execute it and I get the output. Um, and you get that output kind of as it's produced. So if you have a cell that runs for a long time and produces output, you get that output as it comes. And um, there, for one notebook, you have one process that's running. So that means that the state uh, of the kernel, you run some code that maybe defines some variables. Then in another cell, you can use those variables and produce derivative computations. And that so that state is long running, um, and you can keep updating it. And this lets you modify the code that you're running a little piece at a time without having to rerun the whole thing. You only rerun the, the pieces that you ask it to. Now, IPython, um, which the I is for interactive, is all about extending the Python language to improve the interactive experience. And one of those things is about asking, a lot of that surrounds asking questions in some way. And so the first thing that IPython adds to the Python language um, is syntax around the question mark. So what's the simplest question you can ask? That's just question. And so if you just execute a, a, a question mark, it'll, you'll get some output telling you 
uh, about IPython, what IPython can do, um, and all the, the things that IPython adds to Python. Um, this, one, in fact, covers a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the next question is, you know you've got uh, an object that you're interested in, maybe a function, um, but you're not quite sure how to use it. Maybe you don't know um, what arguments it takes. Maybe you don't know the order of the arguments. Often that means you have to go somewhere else and start looking at documentation, um, or you just start trying to call it and see what happens. Um, but in IPython, an interactive session, if you just take that object or function, and then you put a question mark on the, at the end, then you'll actually see the signature, in this case named tuple, um, con constructs objects, uh, uh, classes called named tuples. Um, and we can see the signature, so we can see how to call it. And then the doc string has some examples for like how to create a point class with named tuple. So I could just take, take these examples, and I could copy and paste them. Oops, without that. And another thing that um, IPython does is it rec kind of, it tries to recognize when you so in an, in a Python example they often come with prompts like this these triple uh, triple caret and then the actual code to be executed um, so often when you're copying code from somewhere such as from a doc string like this um, you'll have those prompt prefixes and those can be kind of annoying to have to go line by line and delete the prefixes um, but IPython recognizes those and says oh that's not actually code that you typed that's that's a prompt. So it will strip that before evaluating the code, to, just to make it a little bit easier to copy copy something from some documentation and then run it interactively. So the next question that you might want to ask, so the single question mark tells you what the um, what the object wants you to know. So the doc string, the signature, kind of the, the public information about that. So that's, that's usually uh, what you're after of, how do I use this, what does it do? maybe references to, to other things that I might be interested in. The next question is, so you're really, really interested, maybe the doc string isn't very helpful, or maybe you, you read the doc string and it's not doing what you think it, it should be doing. Um, you wanna uh, ask a deeper question, so you just add one more question mark. So we've got two question marks now. Um, and we're gonna look at the collections.counter class. And what this does is it does the same thing, um, except instead of pulling the doc string, it pulls the entire uh, source code for the class. So Python has, uh, being an interpreted language, um, gives you really easy access to the, the source code of everything that, uh, that you're currently using. So the first thing I can see is that counter is a subclass of a dictionary. And that's, that's, that's clear from, from this line, it's a class counter, and it is a subclass of, of dictionary. And I can see uh, the doc string, and I can see uh, it's, it's methods, so you can see it has a most common method um, and how to use that. So now if I create a, a counter, now I can say, okay, how do, I, how do I use most common? And I can see how that works. Say, okay, so I want to show the n most common elements, so show me the two most common elements in my string and their counts. So those are the, the two questions of how do I use this and what does it actually do? Um, and finally, uh, if you add an asterisk, this, this does um, simple searching pattern matching. So I can see everything in my namespace that has the text int, um, or in the case of NumPy, um, which is an array library that has lots of things that do operations on arrays, and maybe I want to find out, um, show me everything that NumPy does with arrays. And this shows me every uh, method and attribute on NumPy that has array somewhere in it. So not just everything that starts with array or ends with array, but everything that has the text array somewhere. So this lets you, maybe you remember something about the method you're, you're, you want to use, but you've forgotten a little bit. Uh, maybe you've forgotten exactly what it's called, and this lets you quickly just refresh your memory and, and find the methods that you need. And finally, if you execute percent uh, quick ref, um, you get a quick Kind of reference card of the things uh, that IPython can do, and using this can help you refresh your memory of, of what you can do with IPython. Um, 
So an, a really important part of um, the interactive coding experience is tab completion. So anytime you're typing, um, then you just press tab and IPython will try to figure out what are the available strings that you can start, um, start using. And as you type, um, it will filter it down to the matches. And then you can complete it. And this is uh, using tab completion to type is, uh, is really useful. Um, for one, because it helps you eliminate typos. So if you start typing a method, um, and so let's say I start typing array and then I hit tab, it's like, wait, why am I not getting any results? Well, it's because I typed it wrong. Um, and so using tab completion to uh, complete your typing actually really helps you reduce um, uh, typos because all of the all of the symbols that you're actually inputting are only coming from the, the collection of symbols that already exist. All right, so now um, moving on to actually running some code. So we've got evaluating uh, a little bit of code. Um, the previous result, uh, maybe you've done some computation that takes a little while and you realize you want to do something with the result of that last execution. That's always available as a variable called underscore. Um, so if I do 2 plus 10, I get 12. Um, but then if I do underscore, that's always a reference to the previous execution. So if I rerun this cell, the previous execution is actually the cell that I'm looking at right now. Um, and this is an important uh, thing with uh, Jupyter in general, that the actual space orientation of uh, your cells isn't, doesn't uh, course have, to, have to correspond to the order of execution. Right? So you can execute a bunch of cells, and then you can go back up to the top and re-execute um, some earlier part and jump down. So you can have um, the cell's execution actually be out of order. And that's part of what these prompt numbers mean. Of see, this is uh, input number 91, and this one's number 93. And if I keep executing it, the prompt number keeps increasing because it's actually the 96 execution. Um, and the, the intervening executions aren't, aren't uh, available anymore. You can't see the inputs, but they did happen. And then finally, the outputs um, are stored in a variable called out. Um, so if you want to look up and see there's output 96, I can, I can see output um, 96. Um, so you can use those as variables in, just in case you didn't um, put a handle on, uh, on the output when you, when you computed it. <clears throat> and we can see um, the history of the commands uh, that I executed um, with, if I do percent history, um, and then I get dash n one to five. This shows me the, the first five executions. So just applying what we've learned so far with question mark um, and this uh, history magic that lets you see uh, the commands that you've executed. Um, so we're going to come up with a task of how could we write the last ten lines, the la most recent ten lines of history, uh, to a file using uh, this percent history command. The first thing we do is, so I don't know how to do that, but I know I'm supposed to use this percent history. So the first thing I do is I put a question mark on it. Saying, I know what I want to use, but I don't know how to use it. And then you run that, and you get a doc string. We can skim through this and see what we can do. And one of the arguments is um, dash f for file name. I know I want to do something with a file. What's that do? Instead of printing the output to the screen, redirect it to a given file. So I know that's one of the things I want to do. The next one is dash l limit. It says get the last n lines uh, from all sessions. So if I want to send the last uh, 10 lines to a file, um, I would do history dash l10 for the last 10 lines, um, and then dash f you know, my. And if I did. I can see some executions. So the next thing that IPython does to extend the uh, Python language, so we saw um, question mark for, for interrogating code and seeing what, what it can do. The next thing we do is exclamation point. And what that does, so Python has all kinds of uh, facilities for talking to the underlying system. Listing files showing the 
um, current location, uh, calling out to subprocesses. But these are all uh, extremely verbose. Um, they're, they're fine for library code, but if I wanted to um, execute a command um, on the file system and then get its output, uh, that's a little bit tedious interactively because it'd have to do something like import subprocess p equals subprocess dot p open ls dash l out equals subprocess pipe p dot communicate. Oh, now I see it's byte loaded. Right, so that's calling a simple uh, shell program and it's just seeing its output. That's a little tedious in Python. Um, if I were in uh, a shell, a regular terminal, um, right, so if I, if I open a terminal, I can do the same thing just with ls-l. That's all I wanted to do, just ls-l and see the output. What IPython does is with exclamation point, anything you type after an exclamation point, it sends a shell command and then captures and redisplays the output. It basically does all of this stuff for you. Um, and you can just type the shell command uh, that you may already be familiar with. So if I do uh, bang pwd, I can see the current working directory. I can do lsla, etc. And for certain things, uh, for certain common commands, uh, we kind of already know uh, that it's a shell command, and so I can just type ls, um, and that is the same as if I had run ls in the um, uh, in the shell. In addition to this, you can assign the result of a shell command. So here I've got ls, which is um, running the shell command ls, and I'm assigning it to the Python variable files. And then I can look at what the results are, and what I get is a list. And that list is, um, each item in that list is a line in the output of that command. But now I've got the output of a shell command in a Python variable, and I can iterate through that Python variable um, and see the contents. And I can also go the other way. So I have a Python variable, and I want to use that Python variable as an argument in a shell command. So with shell commands, you use dollar sign. So I've got the Python variable files. Um, and I'm calling the shell command echo, and I actually see those files, that fi Python files variable as a string um, in the, the echo command. And I can also, if you use curly braces with something called Python fancy formatting, then you get, um, you can put an expression in here, saying like, take the first item from the files list and cast it to uppercase and use that as the argument uh, to the shell command. And these can be anywhere in a line uh, of, of logic. So here's a Python cell iterating through some files and then under certain conditions it's calling out to the shell command and then other times it's making uh, Python calls. It's just kind of mixing and matching shell commands and regular Python code. So the, the next and probably uh, biggest extension that uh, IPython adds to the Python language is something called magics. And magics are um, anytime a line starts with a percent sign, um, that's uh, what we call a Python magic. And a magic is really a Python function, um, but that Python function gets called, instead of calling it with Python arguments, it gets called with the rest of the line as uh, a string. So the time it magic is a magic for doing timing and profiling and um, kind of measuring how long something takes. Um, and then you give the rest of the line some Python code. And then we, when we run it, we take uh, that Python code uh, and then we measure how long it takes. And so timeit is a module in the Python standard library that's really useful for doing sampling and measuring of timings. And so when you want to measure how long something takes, what you usually do is you don't run it once and see how long that takes you run it a whole bunch of times in order to get an accurate representation of how long uh, calling that, uh, running that code typically takes. And using the time it module, again, this is uh, a recurring theme with uh, IPython, using the time it module, it's, it's really good, it does, does everything you need, 
but it's kind of tedious. You have to instantiate an object, you have to define setup code, you have to pre-specify how many times to run the code that you want to measure. Um, so usually what you do is you say, run this 100 times um, and measure how long it takes to run that code 100 times and then sample it, um, run, do that whole 100 time, 100 execution run three times and get some statistics about, uh, about that. But figuring out the right number of times to run it um, is, can be kind of a pain. Because un until you know how long it takes, you don't know how many times you want to run it. Um, and so that's kind of, it's kind of an annoying process. And you have to time it once in order to figure out how many times you actually want to run it to get an accurate measurement. So this is the part that IPython automates for you. When you give something to time it, what it does is it runs it once, figures out how long it takes, and then generates uh, appropriate default values to say, for you know, interactive human patients, how many times can I run this uh, in less than two seconds-ish? So because this is very fast, it takes uh, about 14 microseconds, um, what it did was it ran it, um, it did seven samples, of 100,000 runs. So it ran, it ran that bit of code 700,000 times. Um, and so that, that's what we call a line magic with the 1% on the line. Um, a cell magic is very much like a line magic, except um, instead of taking the uh, line as the input, it takes the rest of the line as one input and then takes the rest of the cell uh, as a second input. So this cell magic is responsible for defining what it, what it means to have uh, this code in the rest of the cell. In the case of the time magic, it's it's just more Python code, but it could be SQL for writing queries. Um, it could be HTML um, for putting output on the page. Um, so an example of this um, is if I did HTML, um, I can do bold. bold text. All right, so it's the this HTML magic determines what the rest of the cell uh, means. And here I'm running timing using the time it magic um, in an iteration, saying how long does it take to run this sample for a collection of sizes. Um, and it's, it's just going to run that a few times. And we'll see um, one of the consequences of the automatic measurement. We can see when it's small, when there's only 100 items, it runs it a million times. Um, 200 items, I think it'll probably also be a million times. But then. At some point, it'll it'll cross over, yeah. So because at three hundred, it starts taking more than two microseconds, it drops down to a uh, hundred thousand, um, because it doesn't want the total run to take more than two seconds. Because this the the default for uh, time in IPython is kind of targeted at we don't want you to wait too long, but you can specify. Um, so if I if I do something that will take a long time, so a tenth of a second. We'll see how many times it actually it picks for that. Because if I had run this tenth of a second a million times, that would take a really long time to get a result. Um, but in this case, because it takes 100, micro, 100 milliseconds, it says, I'm only going to run this 10 times because I don't want um, you to. You know, the whole point of this is an interactive experience. I want to give it something like an interactive time scale. And then if we look at, if we ask time at what it can do, we can see, oh, you can specify things like the the number of repeats, the number uh, of iterations, if for some reason the default is, is not what you want it to do. Additionally, um, as we saw with the HTML one, uh, the, a cell magic can totally redefine what the cell means, because what IPython is doing is it's taking that rest of the cell as text, and it's just passing that as an argument uh, to the magic function. And the magic function can do whatever it wants. In this case, the bash magic says, take that code, instantiate a bash shell, and then execute that, show, that code with bash. Um, the same thing with Ruby. So this lets you put a little bit of Ruby code in your Python notebook if you want. A useful um, example sometimes, if you want to make sure that everything is encapsulated in a notebook that you can share, and you want to do some operation with a small file, um, the right file magic says on the line, give it a file name, and then the rest of the the rest of the cell gets written to that file. So maybe you're illustrating using some shell program or something that reads files from disk, um, and you want to just generate a, a quick sample file, maybe a little CSV or something, um, 
You can do that with the right file magic. And then we can use the shell escape to call cat and see the contents of that file. If you want to see all the magics that you have, there's a magic called LS magic that gives you a list uh, of all the magics um, that you have. These are all the names of the line magics I currently have and all the names of the cell magics I currently have and then the classes they're uh, defined on. So one of the magics I'm going to investigate is this um, precision magic. What does that do? You can see what does precision do? So it sets the floating point precision for pretty printing. So if I look at um, math.py, oh, this actually might, because I've done some, I didn't restart my notebook from the beginning, this might not be what I wanted to. Yeah, it's not doing what I wanted to. Um, So I'm going to restart my kernel because I'd run this to make sure it all worked. Um, and then I forgot to restart it before I started teaching. So there's some consequences of code that I ran at the end um, that are affecting uh, code that I'm running in the middle. This is something that I run into. Restarting the process gets everything uh, from scratch. So now if I run this code, uh, that looks ever so slightly different if you notice the typography. <laughs> um, but now if I do precision two and then I run the same code, it's just rounding the display. So maybe I don't care about all these uh, extra digits uh, of pi, or, or maybe you're printing arrays with lots of numbers and you, don't, you only care about the ballpark uh, of those numbers. Um, so if I had um, right, if I want to be able to see a bunch of numbers, um, but I only care about um, you know one uh, decimal place because I only care about the things that are significantly above zero. Um, precision lets you um, kind of truncate the the output so that you can fit more information in a smaller area if you care less uh, about the details of the precision of that output. And it's not changing anything about the math. It's just changing uh, when we display this to you, um, how do we choose to display floating point numbers? So here we see another um, pasted example with the prompts that you get uh, from Python documentation often um, computing a Fibonacci sequence and we get so now I'm going to write uh, a file uh, called my module um, and it defines two functions and then I'm going to call that and I'm going to call it with something that will produce an error so IPython produces slightly nicer errors than default Python does. It's all using standard Python facilities. But maybe I'm looking, so I can see the code that I ran. I called this with zero. Um, but there's you know a few steps in the call stack, and maybe I can't quite follow everything that's happening. Something you can do is change the exception mode with the X mode magic. And now if I run the same, uh, same code again to the same error, now there's extra context information. I can see when I called f, I called f with y equals 0. When I called uh, inside f, I can see that x equals 1. And so this makes it clear, OK, 1.0 divided by 1 minus 1, that's going to fail with the zero division error. And so verbose mode lets you, it gives you extra information of showing you the variables in each scope of the stack frame. Um, so at each level, I can see what all the variables are and maybe more easily see what's wrong uh, with the code when I see that error. Following on from that, maybe even maybe even that report isn't enough. I can run the debug magic, um, and that drops me into an interactive debugger, um, and I can say, okay, what's x, um, what's f? I can go up the stack frame, and now I'm in g. What's y, um, etc. So IPython lets you drop into an interactive debugger. To this is called a postmortem debugger, um, to interact with the. Uh, Kind of poke around and see what see what went wrong. Additionally, you can use the the standard uh, standard library function um, input to read uh, read input from the user. If for some reason you want to ask them a question before you uh, run the code. So in this case, let's see. Okay. Let's see. 
and now I've got a Python variable uh, that stores the answer to the question. And we saw these script magics. Additionally, um, so most of the output, I've produced some HTML output, most of the output so far has been plain text. The, the notebook can also contain images. So here's some matplotlib code that produces a plot, and that just shows up in line in my notebook as, as an image. So your notebook can contain not, not just the, the text output, but also you know, any, any images and things that might be illustrating the work that you're doing that you want to communicate. And beyond that, it can also be interactive. So something, a uh, project called uh, IPython Widgets uh, lets you produce uh, interactive controls. So when I ran this code with this interact decorator, um, because of the types of the arguments, I can see that num is an integer, text is a string, and check is a boolean. So when I get a boolean, I get a check mark. And every time I change one of these controls, it actually reruns that function. So when I move the slider, I can see that it's being called with the new value of the number. I can change the text. And every time I change one of those inputs, it's re rerunning that function. And that can be really useful for things like exploring parameter spaces of, you know you want to call this function, maybe it's a filter function, or it's got some tuning parameters in a machine learning model or, or something like that. Um, and you know, I want it somewhere in this range. Well, if you can produce a figure or text output of the results, you can use widgets to quickly um, explore the sensitivity to a parameter or something like that. So here's, this is why my uh, precision magic didn't work, right? Because I had done this. Um, SymPy is a symbolic math library for doing uh, manipulation of equations and things. I am writing, uh, an equation that uses SymPy to factor x to the n minus 1. And I'm interacting with it. So I can say x to the 11 minus 1 equals this. And I can sort of explore okay, how does the factoring of x to the n minus 1 change as I change n. And I can just quickly move the slider and, and see, see how that works. Or I can do, I can look at plotting uh, a discretization of sine omega t. And I've got a frequency, um, I've got a maximum time, so if I change the maximum time, then I get more, you know, moving out past, I'm expanding this x-axis, I can make it shorter, I can increase the frequency, which is for the most part the same as increasing the time, it's just not changing the number on the bottom. And I can also change the number of samples uh, in the line, so I can use a pretty small number of samples as long as the um, frequency is low, but then if I increase the number of oscillations, I can see I'm not resolving the features very well. And then I need to turn the number of points up back up to get a smooth line. All right, and that's, that's the kind of thing of um, quickly exploring some uh, parameter space with uh, the interactive widgets, and then I can use that input to um, produce something uh, that's uh, to pick the right values and then use that uh, from this point. So for the rest of the time, um, we're going to use a, uh, a use case kind of demonstrating what some of the process, what, what you might be using these some of these magics and the IPython functionality for um, optimizing, um, optimizing some code, some physics code um, with, uh, with Cypher. So I'm going to set up my, my plotting by importing matplotlib and seaborn. Um, I can look at the, so I've got my time at magic, um, and I'm, here I'm timing matrix multiplies of different sizes. You can see how long they take. Um, one of the things that we didn't cover in, in the first introduction of time at is that it actually returns something called a time at result that includes all kinds of uh, um, so if we have this dash O, it returns a result, and now TR, the TR variable, is a time at result object um, that has some summary, and I can see the best time, I can see the worst time, I can also get all the numbers if I want to do my own statistics on that. I can create a histogram from all those runs, so I can see this code almost always takes 
less than 200 microseconds, but then once in a while, it actually takes um, over a millisecond. So there's some uh, some randomness in, in there, something that makes it take a little extra time sometimes. Um, and then what we're going to do for the rest of the time is this, uh, we're going to diffuse a wave. So we have the math for the for a sawtooth wave. And I'm not going to implement that because I can just import it from SciPy. So here's uh, a sawtooth wave. And then the physics that we're going to implement is diffusing that, that sawtooth wave by uh, evolving the heat equation. So the heat equation is used um, to do things like uh, a Gaussian blur um, or diffusion of, uh, of material or heat in, in a system. We can implement, so here's my differential equation. Um, I can create a, what's called a finite, finite difference time domain um, discretization of that equation. The most important thing is that this tells me my boundary conditions. So I just have fixed uh, boundary conditions. And then at each time step, this is this tells me what the the value at a given point in, in my wave should be based on the value uh, at the previous uh, uh, the previous state of the wave. So if I look at a pure Python implementation, I take this this equation and just write it down literally. So the item um, in the variable is a quarter times the one on the left. Uh, plus the one on the right, plus two times the one in the middle. And that's kind of a weighted averaging of the local uh, area. Um, so that's just, that results in kind of a smoothing by taking, um, rather than saying the next value here is the same as the previous value, you say take this, take the previous value, but also move it a little bit closer to the two on uh, that are next to it. And the result of that is a smoothing of the wave. So it takes those sharp points and then it smooths them out. And um, what we're gonna do for the rest of the time is exploring different implementations uh, of this exact same algorithm uh, and exploring the performance. Um, and with that, I think we have a 15 minute break. And we'll get to profiling and how to do all that interactive, figuring out what the fastest way is and how much faster in an interactive way uh, for the rest of the time. We've implemented this um, blur algorithm in Python, and this is, if you're maybe doing last minute Python homework, this notebook might be uh, useful to you, but I think everybody's all well done with it already. Right. Um, so we're gonna use our time at magic to run our Python implementation of this blur algorithm, um, and then we're gonna record that and we're going to use this, the, the best run of this Python implementation as our reference time as we measure relative performance. So this is just running, um, running our Python blur uh, a few times and saying, OK, it took on the order of a second-ish, a little bit less than a second. So if you're uh, familiar with optimizing uh, Python code, and I, I understand you've, you've learned a bit about Cython, uh, one of the main things that you need to do in trying to make Python code fast is avoid doing lots of Python operations um, in kind of nested uh, element-wise iterations. That's kind of the worst case scenario for Python performance is doing a bunch of really, really tiny operations in Python. And so this is taking an array, and then for each element in that array, it's doing a little operation um, in Python and then iterating through that uh, all the points in that array. So since this is an array operation, one of the logical first places to go uh, is a library called NumPy. Uh, and NumPy is a C library for um, doing numerical uh, operations on arrays. It has some basic linear algebra, um, but it has a bunch of really nice um, uh, operations on uh, doing element-wise operations and things. So for our, in our Python implementation, we were evolving many time steps, and there's not a lot you can do to make those uh, time steps uh, more efficient. But for the element-wise operations, um, you, can, you can make that a lot, uh, a lot more efficient. And in this case, what we can do is um, 
do something called what we call vectorizing. And that's taking that inner loop of instead of saying for each element in the, uh, in the array, make a single uh, operation um, that does all of that in one line, one Python execution. And that says, take, take our array and say from just one, one cell in from both edges, um, we do that, um, that smoothing saying, take, take the array in one from the left and in one from the right, um, and take uh, that uh, smooth with an array of the same length that's shifted uh, two from the right edge and the array that's shifted two from the left edge. And this is the same, uh, the same math uh, that we were doing one element at a time, but we're doing it um, with uh, views on the array instead of one, one element at a time in Python. We're saying take, uh, take views of the array and do kind of whole array sub, uh, arithmetic uh, at a, uh, doing the whole array in one operation. So if we run this, um, so we can see that we, we replace the inner loop. Instead of two for loops, we have one for loop and one array operation. So that array operation does the exact same thing as the for loop did. Um, it's just doing it uh, with NumPy instead of uh, with uh, um, Python. So I can run that code. We get the same result. Um, and we can run uh, a timing of that. And so now that we've got, um, at this point, we're going to have two times, and we can start uh, visualizing how, how the performance works. So this time we got 10 milliseconds. You may not remember how long the previous one took, but it was a lot more than that. So let's um, write a function for plotting the relative uh, performance of our blur implementations. So we keep appending to the list times and the list labels, and then we do we make a bar chart saying, so this is kind of our reference implementation. Um, we don't care how long it took. All we care about is how much faster all the other implementations are. So in this case, we see that NumPy is almost exactly 100 times faster than Python. And all I did was rewrite one for loop with one uh, array operation. So this is how uh, optimizing Python is often about trying to get rid of um, Python iteration and replace it with uh, single calls to some uh, C function. And if you look at the code in NumPy, it's still doing an element-wise iteration. It's just doing it in C instead of uh, in uh, in Python. But that's the that's the difference between writing something in C and writing something in uh, in Python. If you've got a library that already does it, like NumPy, calling that library is great. Um, if you don't have a library that uh, can already do it, um, then you might need to write uh, those. Uh, uh, you might need to write that in Python, which is in fact what NumPy uses to implement many of these algorithms. So how much faster did we get? We got about 80 times faster. So Cython, um, which you have uh, for your assignment, um, is a way of writing kind of writing C and Python at the same time. So your app, what the Cython language does is it generates uh, C code that talks to the Python API that you can then call from Python. And where when we bring Cython and IPython together, um, so one of the disadvantages of using something like Cython is now you've got a compile step. Just like you were, if you were writing C code, you write your uh, PYX Cython file, and then you have to run Cython to compile that to a Python module, and then you can run code uh, to import that and, and use it. So the Cython package provides an IPython magic. So to improve that interactive experience of, I, I know I can make this faster in Cython but maybe I don't know exactly how to make it faster in Cython. Well, we've got the time at magic to help me measure how I'm doing on performance. Um, and then Cython provides a Cython magic to make it a little bit more convenient to write and test Cython code interactively. So I'm gonna load the Python extension. So this is load ext. I load the extension provided by the Cython package. And now I have a Cython cell magic. So instead of writing Python code in this cell, I write Cython code. And this is, this is Python code, but what, what happened when I ran that cell is Cython took that text, it generated it, it wrote it out to a PYX file, it ran the Cython compile on, compiler on it, generated the .c uh, Python extension, compiled that with a C compiler, 
and then imported that module um, into my current interpreter. And then I have the CSUM function available to use right away. So all those things are things you could do, you know, write the Cython file, compile it, um, restart your interpreter because you can't reload uh, Python modules. Um, you have to kill the process and start a new process to import the same module again. Uh, but now I can call CSUM uh, right away. So this is a really nice way of quickly figuring out um, the Cython code that you want to run because it's just in a cell, write your Cython code, compile it, um, and then get it out. Uh, and this lets you figure out, uh, interactively figure out what the, what the exact Cython code you want to write is much more efficiently than um, that workflow of write your Cython module, compile the whole thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So here's literally the same code, um, but calling it psum to do it in, uh, in, uh, in Python. Um, a handy, uh, uh, so that we can compare performance, a really handy um, thing in the Cython magic uh, is this dash A for annotate. Um, and what this does, so this is the same, the exact same cell as this one, but with the dash A added. And instead of just compiling it and giving me no output, what it does is it gives me uh, an HTML rendering um, of my Cython code, but it, see these uh, yellow highlights? I can click on each line and it shows me the C code that each Cython line corresponds to. And the color, the intensity of that yellow uh, corresponds to how much um, C code, how many lines of C code, and how many uh, Python AP, uh, API calls uh, does that line correspond to. So if I look, I can see um, that I'm iterating through um, a Python list, um, and you don't need to understand the C API functions. The only thing you need to understand is that there's a lot, and I want there to be less. Um, so we can see that this iteration, um, if you know a little bit about, about Cython, one of the main things Cython does is that if you've got simple iterations, it can replace those with uh, a regular pure C for loop, um, which is much more efficient than a Python iteration, which has to do a bunch of Python API calls every time you get an, L get an item from that iterator. Um, and the key to uh, Cython optimization is Cython, the more Cython knows about what code you're running, the more it can translate Python code into actual raw C code rather than just the same Python code compiled in the, with the C API. And the performance is the same. If you just take Python code and then rewrite the Python C API code that that corresponds to, it's not any faster. Um, but if you can teach Cython saying that, oh, that N, it, I'm using it in a range, so it's going to be an integer. And my, my iteration variable, that's also an integer. And then Cython knows that this is an integer and this is an integer. So it knows how to do for i in range n when those are integers. It knows how to generate a pure C for loop for that. So just by adding, telling Cython that the input is an integer and that the uh, iteration variable is an integer, now the for loop is literally a, a pure C for loop. So there's no Python type checking or error checking. It's just doing a, Py a C for loop. But the inner loop is still doing, um, taking CS um, is a Python variable, um, and it has to cache that from a C variable. So a Python integer is not a um, computer. In, in, your, uh, in your machine, an integer is, you know, four or eight bytes of, uh, of memory that's interpreted as an integer. In Python, everything is an object. So it's an object with attributes and everything. It's not a machine integer. It's a whole bunch of Python stuff around uh, an integer value. So when you're working with a Python integer and a C integer, you need to do these conversions back and forth. So if we further add that, um, this function returns an integer, and our temporary variable uh, for the running sum is uh, also an integer. Now we can see there's almost no yellow in our function because this is literally just adding two integers, and our for loop 
is just a C function. So now it's just a regular C running sum. So now we've, we've essentially gotten all the Python code out of the, um, we've gotten all the Python code out of the loop. So if we look at the timings of a, doing running all these sum implementations, so the Cython implementations and the Python one, um, we can see the performance. So the first one, 60 milliseconds. No, well, that's okay. The second one, 50 milliseconds, we got 20% faster maybe. Next one, we got two more milliseconds. That's not a lot. Um, so two more milliseconds. So that was getting all of that. Um, so getting that pure C for loop got us almost nothing. So get, compiling the same code with Cython got us 20%. Getting that pure C for loop um, while still having Python code in the inner loop actually got us approximately nothing. Um, but then in our last run, oh wait, that number's bigger, that maybe it's actually slower, but then you look at the units, these are all milliseconds, this is nanoseconds. So once we finally got to that final, final Cython version, it's a million times faster. So just telling it that that, inner, inner, that running temporary variable is an integer, that gets us uh, six orders of magnitude performance. So often um, you need, uh, this is the kind of performance you can get from using Cython um, for uh, C for iteration instead of uh, Python for iteration. But the really important thing is get that those Python API calls out of your inner loop. So that's the most important thing uh, for optimizing with Cython. And this annotate, even if you, you look at the code and you think, I know what, I mean, once you're really comfortable with Cython, you can look at some Cython code and say, I know that this isn't going to make any Python API calls, but it's a whole lot easier to be sure if you use this Cython annotate to say, like, compile this for me, what code did you actually generate, and make sure that there isn't any, there aren't any bold yellow lines uh, in your inner loop, because that means it's not, it's not going to be as fast as you think it might be. So Cython isn't magic. Cython is, is a uh, um, explicit deterministic take this code and generate uh, the corresponding C code. And it's, you really need to tell Cython what, uh, uh, what you're working with in order for it to generate really efficient C code. So now taking what we just learned, writing a cumulative sum, um, applying that same uh, information to our blur implementation. So we start out um, with the NumPy implementation. This is our um, uh, no, sorry, not the NumPy. We should start out with the Python implementation exactly as it is. So again, we got a lot of yellow because we haven't done uh, we haven't done a lot of work yet. Um, so we, we shouldn't expect a lot from this. This is taking the exact same code and running it with Cython. So how much can Cython do if we don't tell it anything? The answer is not a lot. So this is the Cython implementation um, without any type hints or anything. And we say, OK, how much faster is that? Um, I don't know, 20%. So we got, we got almost nothing from that. Because we didn't tell Cython what anything is. Um, and because NumPy is itself, uh, NumPy is a Python API wrapper around C arrays. Um, NumPy, Cython, if you tell something, uh, if you tell Cython that an argument is a NumPy array, it can actually talk directly to the C memory without calling any Python API functions. So the NumPy library has a C API that can be used without calling the Python API at all. So if I know um, here, I'm telling Cython that my iteration variables, this is what I did in um, the uh, C sum of saying, all right, let's make sure that our iteration variables uh, are integers so that I can get those nice um, pure C for loops. So we can see, all right, I got all my, I got all my Python code out of those iterations. There's still a bunch in the inner loop. We'll figure that out in a little bit. Um, but at least I got it out of the out of the loops themselves. So now my iteration, uh, at least, is going to be in C. So how are we doing? 
Okay, we got a little bit more. Not a lot, but a little bit. We know that NumPy is not quite a best case scenario, but NumPy, we know that NumPy is itself doing pure C iteration through, uh, in that element wise operation. So we know that we should be able to get pretty close to that if we're writing the raw, the raw C code. So the next thing to do with, since Cython understands, if you tell me it's a NumPy array, I know how to address that memory and work with those elements um, without calling uh, the Python. So in Python, when you do like bracket uh, I, it's calling a Python method called get item. Um, and if you don't tell it, if you don't tell Cython that it's an array, it's for each item in that array, it actually has to say, um, call the Python get item method uh, on that array object. And that's what's really inefficient. Um, so getting that out of the way is saying, tell Cython that this array is, an, is a NumPy array of doubles with uh, a 1D array uh, uh, of doubles. So I'll define all my temporary variables, um, saying that all, all the arrays that I have are um, uh, 1D arrays of doubles. So how does that look? It's better. You know, it's, our, our yellow's not as bold. Um, but what are we doing? So here's um, where are we spending all our Python API calls? And you can see there's there are these unluck, unlikely blocks that says raise index error. So this is like if you ask for an item outside an array and you get um, so if I did like x if I had code like x uh, two thousand. We get an index error, so right because my the um, it's only five hundred uh, items long. If I ask for something way outside, Python gives me a nice index error, and it's important to do those bounds checks because if I didn't do those bounds checks in Cython code, um, what C code gives you instead of an index error is something called a segmentation fault. So have you ever heard of seg faults? What those are when you ask for memory that you don't actually have access to, um, you're asking for a different segment of memory that you're not allowed to get. So, and the difference between a Python index error and a C segmentation fault is that your program dies when you get the C error. Your Python program, you get a nice exception and you can try again. Um, in the, uh, if you get the C error, then your whole process is gone uh, and there's nothing you can do about it. So when you say it's a 1D array, um, before accessing elements, in order to make sure that there's not a seg fault, Cython is saying, are you asking something outside on the left? Are you asking for something outside on the right, uh, et cetera. And then this is really um, the kind of complicated, expanded C operation. It's, it's the, the element-wise operation that we did um, in Python, and it's a pure C line. So of uh, the code, that's now in our inner loop, 100% of the Python API calls are checking the bounds, making sure that you don't get a seg fault. Um, because the actual numerics, it, it knows you told me the NumPy arrays. I know that these are integer indices, that the array is doubles. It can, write, it can do the actual math in pure C as long as it's checked first that you're not going to ask for something outside the array. So how's this one? Now that we've told it it's an array, how are we doing, relatively speaking? Faster than NumPy. That's pretty good. So by making sure that we told Cython everything about what we're using, saying these are 1D NumPy arrays of doubles, our, you know, our temporary iteration variables and everything are integers, um, now we're faster than NumPy. Um, so that's pretty good. Right? A lot of people work on NumPy. Um, so we're, we're doing pretty well. And the reason we're faster than NumPy is the temporary variables. So when you do that array operation um, of the slice over here and the slice over there, every time you do an addition, it has to create a new Python object. So um, the reason we're a little bit faster than NumPy is instead of creating, um, I think, three temporary arrays in the process of computing the right-hand side, right? because when NumPy does take the middle and add 
the left, then it create it does that, creates a new array, and then it says take that and add uh, the right, then it creates a new array, and then it assigns that. So there's a, there are, are a few temporary arrays that it has to create and destroy in the process of our NumPy implementation. So in the Cython implementation, we don't have to create as many temporary uh, objects, so we're a little bit more efficient. So our final optimization, we know our code is correct because we're not getting those index errors. What we can do is say, hey, Cython, trust me. Don't check the bounds. I'm not going to make any errors. Um, and this essentially, by adding these macros that say, don't check the bounds and don't check the index wraparound for negative indices. Because I know that I'm, I'm iterating from the beginning to the end, um, and I know that I have made no mistakes, um, and I'm never going to ask for an element outside the array. Um, and what this does is now it's just a bunch of temporary variables and then kind of the, the corresponding C code for uh, doing that element-wise operation. My iterations are also pure C. So the whole thing is pure C, no Python API calls at all. If I had made an error in this code, now I can, with this code, now I can seg fault. If I, if I accidentally iterated, you know, if I had an off by one error and I iterated just past the end of the array, I can seg fault now. Um, so I've asked Cython to trust me to not make mistakes. And this is the kind of optimization saying, I, I might get something for this, um, but I'm also paying the price that I, I'm no longer trusting Cython to give me uh, nice errors and I'll get uh, really opaque seg faults that are hard to debug. Um, but because this one's relatively simple and I've run it a bunch of times, um, I know that I'm relatively safe uh, on these things. Yes? One thing you could do was to add uh, a check before you enter the loop mm -hmm. that, uh, that the bounds are what you believe they are to be. Yes, and, and it, the code actually does that because you see um, that, that that's exactly what I should do and um, it, that is in fact what I do is I get the size of the array and then I iterate from one to n minus one. So I know that I'm not going to ask for something between, you know, I'm not going to ask for something past zero and I'm not going to ask for something past n because I, I am confident that this iteration is not going to ask for something outside, um, outside the, the array. So this is the, how simple this iteration is, um, is why I'm comfortable telling Cython not to check the bounds. Um, because I know, you know, it, it's not always easy to know exactly what math the the Python code is going to correspond to in the, in the C code, but this is something I understand. I under, I know that all the numbers between one and the length minus one are inside the array. Um, if I'd done it slightly wrong, like if I had done this, I guess I fall. So you need to be real careful. Um, but if you're confident. Um, that, that it's okay, then we can run this, this fully optimized code and see how are we doing now. So now we've gotten all the Python code, even the bounce checks, and it's just a little safety check. It's just saying, are you going to ask for something mem some memory outside? How are we doing? Uh, so how expensive are those bounce checks? Well, it turns out it's non-trivial, right? Now we're uh, 20 times faster than NumPy, right? So we got another order of magnitude by saying Cython don't check the bounds. So now we've got, what, two, 3,000 uh, times faster than our Python implementation. I'm just verifying we've actually still, we're still doing the same math. We're still getting the same result. We didn't cheat by saying just return the original, the input, and don't actually do the iteration. We are actually doing the math, um, and, and, and we're getting the physics right. So this is Kind of optimizing with Cython is you go through and you see where are the Python API calls, and then you tell Cython as much as you can to say what is all, what are all the objects so that it can generate a, a pure C implementation uh, of your inner loop. That's the key to optimizing with Cython. There's another uh, more modern library called Numba. So Cython's very explicit. Cython this Cython code corresponds to that C code. So it's very one-to-one, -one, really uh, clear. You know, like I'm generating, I'm taking some Cyan code, and it's going to generate C code. And the more I tell it, uh, the simpler the code is that it generates. 
Numba is a modern library uh, that does um, what's called just-in-time compilation. Um, so it uses a, a tracing compiler that says, when you call a function, look at the types. And then based on that, generate the machine code. So actually skip the C part. Generate the machine code um, based on, oh, I saw you, you gave me an NumPy array of doubles. Um, essentially do the same thing that Cython did of generate uh, the low-level uh, uh, machine code um, that corresponds to, I know how to do this fast if you give me uh, a 1D array of doubles. So this is exactly the same code as my Python implementation, but then I pass it to Numba with a decorator called AutoJIT. So JIT for, is for just-in-time compilation. And so what Numba is doing is when you call this, it's going to watch what you do and say, see if it knows how to optimize that. And if it does, it's going to replace the code with an optimized version. So now if I run my Numba blur, how fast is Numba? So this was, so I, I went through all that work of, you know, minimizing the yellow, let's say, um, in my Cython optimization. With Numba, I gave it literally one line. Um, saying, Numba, please make me fast. Um, and how did it do? Well, it did faster than, it did better than literally everything except our final most optimized remove the bounce checks unsafe implementation. Um, so putting in a lot of time uh, into Cython optimization may not be uh, the best use of your time every time. So tools like Numba um, can can do some of this optimization work for you. And this is kind of a best case scenario for Numba because it's a really simple iteration uh, through C arrays. So it's the, it's the kind of thing that is as easy as possible to optimize with Cython and as easy as possible for Numba to figure out uh, what's going on. Um, so in real life, you know, a combination uh, of Cython and Numba and things might be uh, the right way to go. But picking the right tool for the, for the job can be um, have, have an impact on the amount of time you're putting in uh, relative to the, the results that you're getting. One of the downsides of things like um, Numba is because they're kind of magical, um, it's a little harder to see what was going on. So with Cython, we could see, we could really see the C code that it was generating and understand all the optimizations it was making. Um, and it was relatively clear to say, okay, I see this is where I need to spend my time. This is where Cython isn't making enough assumptions. There are assumptions that I know it can make, but it doesn't have enough information to make them. How do I tell Cython um, to make the assumptions it needs to make in order to write optimized code? Numba, um, if you want to see what it looks like when Numba generates code, um, we can see each line. Um, we can see it found A 1D array of floats. Um, there are, we can see that our um, items are, or items in the iteration are um, are 64-bit uh, floats. Um, but this is a lot. This is maybe a little bit harder to parse and see kind of what's going on here. Um, but it's a it's a similar structure to the Cython. Uh, annotate, but it's it, it's a bit harder to to follow uh, what on earth is actually happening, um, and so if if Numba is not fast, it's a it's a good deal harder to figure out how to make Numba fast. Um, so there's a good chance there's a better chance with Numba that it will be fast, even if you don't tell it stuff. Um, but if it's not fast enough, it's a lot harder to get there um, with Numba. Um, it's possible, you know, there's documentation and there are best practices and things. So, um, it's, but with Cython, so it's more intelligible, but you need to do, you need to be more explicit and do more work. Uh, whereas Cython, you do less work, but if you need to do some work, it, it's not as clear uh, and it's harder to, to do that in the first place. So the final piece um, is profiling. So we did, we've been using timing, but we haven't been reaching into the code to see where are we spending our time, what parts of this code are slow, because it was just one loop. We know where we're spending the time. It's in the inner loop. That's that's where all the code is. Yes? One thing I know is I have problems with number in there. 
when you use a, a global statement and say that you want to reference a global variable, mm -hmm. then it seems it appears that Number had problems with that. Uh, yeah, it's possible that Number has problems with referencing global variables because that that violates Number's ability to reason about the state and kind of manipulate the the, the code object uh, of the function because it's now referring to things outside. Um, so it yeah, there there are a number of cases where Number not only will not make it fast, but there's also cases where Number will make it not work anymore. Um, so profiling is a way of saying, so I know this is taking a while, um, but you want to ask the question, um, which part of this code should I be looking at in order to make it fast? So here's a, a script that's just walking, walking some files. So C profile is a module that takes some script, runs it, and then profiles uh, the output. So it says like, run this code, um, watch where we're taking our time. Um, and we get all this output that's not super intelligible, but it's saying like, how much time did I spend in this function? How much time did I spend per call to this function, um, uh, et cetera? And how many times did I call it? And there's a bunch of output, um, but you can, in addition to calling it as a script, um, you can also call it as a module. So this gives me the same, um, this is running the same code, but because this was a really quick operation, um, almost all of the code is actually spent importing modules in the first place. So if I interactively run C profile, I can say just run that code. It's no longer going to measure all of those imports just to get started, which is kind of annoying. It's just going to actually measure um, the calls, um, the calls that I'm actually interested in. In addition, another step. Uh, towards interactivity is there is a magic called prun for take this bit of Python code and run it with a profiler. And so you can, rather than instantiating C profile and everything, we can just pass it to prun and then we can, we can do the measurements. And then another step toward interactivity is a, um, so profiles write a standard file format that describes the timing information and calls and everything. Um, SnakeViz is a tool for visualizing um, the, these profile outputs. So this is kind of a table that's a little bit hard to read um, and see where the, the useful information is. But if I call SnakeViz with the same code, it's just like prun, but it opens a web visualization of where uh, the time is spent. So I can see that this is where all my time is spent is in walking those files. Um, I'm spending time just calling the next method on an iterator. Um, and then you can see I'm spending actually a significant amount of time making a system call called checking if a file is a link or not, and then ultimately building path strings. So this is what this is what Python is doing and where it's spending its time when you're iterate when you're just walking through a directory. So if I change that to a bit of Python code that does a bit more work, so it's the same walk. But in this case, when there's whenever there's a text file, I'm reading that file and then I'm computing a hash of that. So I'm just doing a bit more work per file. And this takes a little bit, little bit of time. So this is changing, changing where I'm spending my time. But now I can see it, this is similar. The walk takes a bunch of time, but now I can see I'm spending some time reading the contents of those files. Um, and then a little bit of, uh, of time spent hashing. So if you're not sure where you're spending your time, profiles can tell you, OK, this is the function um, that's actually taking you all your time. That's where you should put your optimization energy. Right? You, you don't necessarily want to say, oh, I know I want to make this fast, but if you're optimizing something that only takes 10% of the time, then you're not. Uh, it's probably not worth your time to make that one smaller slice even a million times faster, because even if you made it take no time at all, um, you'd only be saving 10% uh, on your total runtime. So profilers let you look at where is it worth spending your time uh, optim optimizing. And line profiler um, is an extension um, that does kind of line by line, rather than 
Um, so the C profile maps to calls. So we can see the calls are like, it's this is time you're spending in LSTAT. This is time you're spending um, in checking if it's a directory. Um, line profiler, instead, we're going to run it with our Python blur. And it shows us, this is our Python code. Where are we spending our time? We're spending 23% of our time doing this iteration. We're spending 75% of our time in our inner loop. So this is a quick illustration of where, where do we spend our time? Um, and then if we look at our NumPy one, we can see we're now with the NumPy one, we're spending 90% of our time in this single NumPy op uh, operation. So optimizing anything outside of this isn't worth our time. Op all we care about, all we should care about is, is there a way that I can make this NumPy operation faster? Maybe fewer temporary variables, something like that. But we don't, it's not worth like trying to figure out how to make this outer iteration faster. Because at the, the best case we would get is 5%. And here's the trade-off of these fancy uh, automatic uh, JIT implementations. If I run this line profiler on Numba, our function was never called. And the reason for that is that Numba, um, you, you give it Python code, but then it actually generates a totally different function that it actually calls every time. So if we want to look at the, the lines that we were spending our time on, it's actually never calling the code that I wrote. Um, so this makes interrogating uh, auto-generated code like, like Numba a little bit harder because um, we can't actually see uh, what, uh, what, we're, uh, what we're actually spending the time on. And similarly, if we call snakeviz on uh, the numpy.dot dot function, which is itself a C function, all we can see is that we spend all of our time in a function called dot. So this is the other downside. You'll also see this with Cython is that when you cross that language boundary, certain profilers become harder to use because they, they're really good at instrumenting Python code and seeing where, where in your Python code you're spending your time, but they don't cross that boundary into C or, or JIT uh, LLVM code. They just, they just tell you where you're spending your time in Python code, um, and then when you cross that language boundary, um, then uh, it's harder to get that profile information out. And that is all. I'm on time.